Thank you, Wagney and Alexander. I gave this presentation, a similar presentation, a couple of years ago in Hawaii at a very similar, the timing of this presentation is, is great because uh, it was, this was Hawaii, it was the afternoon, the early afternoon of the last day of the presentation. So I got to give the presentation to Alexander and to Lee and a, a bunch of tables. So I thank you for being here still. Maybe it's because it's starting to rain outside. What I, I appreciate, uh, uh, Wagon, excuse me, kicking off in kind of a design, pre-design phase, and what I'll try to do is, is sort of jump through my piece of the design phase and talk a little bit more about in construction and in some of the testing. Before I jump into that, I, I, I do want to spend, I, I do want to kind of highlight um, the fact that we're, the timing of this is very interesting in that, as Waggity just mentioned, uh, an ASTM is coming out for, for commissioning the building enclosure. And if any, for anyone that follows the, the iterations of LEED, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But in commissioning the building enclosure is, is, raising, is being raised in awareness as far as it's out there. Uh, and I think equally with it kind of coming in awareness, it's also the, the ambiguity or the, or the questions about what it is, what it should contain uh, are significant. So we're kind of seeing them, them rise together uh, we've probably talked about risk plenty in the last couple of days. Here's a couple of numbers that, that can quantify your risk to, to owners if you want to if you want to scare some people, other than scaring them with with mold, which is always an option. But but nine billion dollars annually in repairing uh, and litigating damages for moisture intrusion in building. It's a pretty that's, that's, that's nine with a B. B is in billion. Big numbers. Uh, and and two thirds of the of callbacks and, and defects are, are moisture related. Here's a couple of the, to follow what Wagney mentioned, here's a couple of the, the standards or guidelines that are out there. 337 pages is how long NIBS guideline three is. It's a pretty big document. Uh, I'll kind of tie all these together. So here, so that's NIBS guideline three. Lead 2012, uh, any, any idea what public comment period we're on here? Any of you USGBC? Yeah, we're on the third, we're, the, the third one just launched, March 1st, I think, is where the public comment period just opened. And guess how LEED quantifies or, or scopes commissioning the building enclosure? They reference NIBS guideline three. So go do this 337 pages of stuff and, and we'll give you a point. We'll give you one point out of, you know, 110. It, it's, a, it's an expensive point. So there's, uh, I guess I, I bring this up to, to kind of highlight that there is still some, lead is going to introduce ambiguity even more. Uh, the, I don't, I'm not gonna get too into the, the nuts and bolts of the ASTM that Waggity mentioned, but uh, it, it does happen to quantify things and, and scope things a lot better, which is, which is beneficial. So it's the, it's the enclosure commissioning pie we talk about and, and, and Wagney talked about pre-design and design. We'll go through some construction and, and performance testing and, and pre-construction occupancy phase scope as well. So here's what Wagney sp spent some good time on, on the owner's project requirement basis of design. Uh, in, in a design build, build, bid build traditional project approach, uh, it, it's probably most common that that the owner is hiring a commissioning agent, a commissioning authority, uh, and, and oftentimes we're seeing that commissioning the building enclosure becomes either a separate entity working for the owner or it actually is a sort of a sub-entity underneath the commissioning authority. Obviously, you, the, the Corps of Engineers spends a, a lot of time in the, the design build world, and so the complexity in, in identifying the owner's project requirements, I mean, what, what's the tool to identify that in a bid build world. I mean, we've got the RFP, that's kind of all we have. You know, one, one document, one contract, one, one entity that's the design builder. And so that's, as, as Wagney mentioned, you know, there can be lots and there can be little and maybe, maybe none at all as far as commissioning the enclosure, how the owner wants to handle that, but it has to be defined pretty early on, certainly in a, a design build environment. Something that, that Wagney did not mention and something that you know, remains to be seen if, it, if it, it becomes a part of a commissioning program is a, a commissioning plan. Folks in here that, that are maybe on the mechanical side of things that, 
They probably review commissioning plans, oversee the commissioning process. Some of the ambiguity that's going to happen, I think, it is happening now and will continue to happen, is, is the word commissioning means mechanical and control systems, maybe some specialty systems. And now we're introducing the building enclosure, which is a different discipline, different, you know, division seven and eight, different letter on the front of your, front of your construction documents. So how that fits together really remains to be seen. Uh, is the commissioning plan for the enclosure put together by the commissioning authority? Is it put together by a separate entity that has the, you know, the fundamental knowledge of the, enclo the, the enclosure systems? Uh, remains to be seen. Wagdy well, talked a, a good bit about you know, some of the scope items that would be involved in design of, of commissioning, things like reviews of documents, um, the, some of the testing, obviously some of the modeling. What I wanted to spend some time on is, is functional performance test specifications or the commissioning specification. And so there, there's a school of thought that the commissioning provider, the commissioning provider often writes the commissioning spec, the commissioning authority, and I'm talking about the controls sort of world, the mechanical systems world. Uh, is the enclosure commissioning spec going to be written by a commissioning authority? by a, you know, an independent third party, by a sub third party. Uh, again, it kind of remains to be seen. Pre-construction, I, I, I can't highlight enough, and, and Wagney mentioned about functional performance testing at the mock-up phase. And I would take the emphasis on laboratory testing and, and really bring that into field testing as well. A, and ideally, it's in a standalone environment. So you see a couple of pictures here with with truly freestanding mock-ups. And the reason I say that as opposed to, you know, maybe the first install, first 5% of, of a window installation or wall installation is, uh, you kind of want to know what's wrong early. And, and mock-ups are, are not just to look pretty. I mean, these ones look very nice, but uh, let's test them. And let's write it into a specification to test them and let's figure out what's wrong with them before we start populating the building with it. Sequencing is something that, that we talked through a little bit as it relates to air tightness, and, and we'll, we'll talk through that a little bit more again as it relates to air tightness, but, but things that, that really need to be figured out in pre-construction. Submittal and shop drawings reviewed, we, we mentioned that as well. The, the key piece of the construction phase in, in commissioning is, is a, a QA program, and, and from the commissioning perspective, and possibly management of a or, or third-party review of a QC program. So, so to the, the topic earlier about inspection versus, versus quality assurance, uh, I think the commissioning provider could provide a role in sort of bridging the two together. We, you're, you're, the commissioning provider is, is providing a periodic QA role, as is the core, and, and you're tying in things like checklists, things like uh, daily inspections that, that are a requirement of the contractor's QC program. Obviously, site meetings would be, would be involved in that. And really, the, the background, you know, we're, we're looking at OPR and BOD. We're verifying construction documents that things are being installed as the construction documents show them, as the manufacturer installation requirements show them. Uh, but really, as Ray mentioned earlier, it's, it's, it's not just a checklist. It's not just a, you know, here's my CDs, here's what's out there. The two, the two meet. It, it's kind of a. There's obviously a knowledge base that's that's critical in, in performing this function. Lots of different tests out there that that could be specified as part of the commissioning process, and I'll I'll wait to show some some photos of that rather than getting into too many ASTMs and, and numbers. Here's some here's some uh, ASTM E1105 you may be familiar with, uh, in a curtain wall or storefront application. Uh, even in, into just a punch window application. And it's an appropriate test for simulating as best we can with a, with a test environmental conditions that, that a cladding system or that a window system is going to experience. Introducing, it's, it's, we can't, we're, we'll have a hard time introducing wind on a building, so we'll draw pressure from the inside and introduce you know, water in a calibrated fashion to the outside of the building. Probably a, a simpler test, a, a hose test or a nozzle test, as it's referred to in many places, but the AMA 501.2 is a, a very simple test that, that really ought to happen on, on just about every project. I'm not sure why it doesn't, 
but it can be revealing in that this is not a simulation of conditions. This is a static condition. There's no, there's no pressure. There's really no, there may be some wind on the specimen, but, but really you're not, you're not introducing any design type pressures inside or outside. If you're building leaks while you're doing this test, you, you've, you certainly got problems. Assembly tests, uh, ASTM E783 is something that can be done on windows and doors. Uh, we also see it specified for opaque wall assemblies, right or wrong. I think there's just not a, there's not a great ASTM test for, for field assembly testing of opaque wall assembly. Uh, and, and this again is, it, it's a tool. I mean, let's use the mock-up and let's run a test like this on the mock-up to identify trade gaps is really where, I mean, how many folks are involved in, in that wall that's there? You know, the, certainly the, 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 window mag, the window installer but whoever's playing with you know, Tyvek in this example or flashing, uh, there, there's trays involved that ought to learn how to sequence with each other and play with each other in the mock-up. And then obviously we're verifying that, that it's gonna perform well as, also. And this is an oldie but a goodie, but you know, missing installation is, infrared thermography is a great tool for obviously identifying air leakage. We've seen that a lot over the last couple of days. And we've been using, the, using it to find missing or wet insulation for some time now. And there's some specialty tests out there too with you know, FM uh, factory mutual type tests for wind uplift, adhesion type tests for specific systems. So really the takeaway is that you know, in identifying the owner's project requirements, we can identify what, what the, the true risk factors are for that, for that owner uh, and, and kind of tailor make what the testing regimen would look like to meet that, that, that OPR. And finally, we've spent quite a bit of time the last couple of days talking about whole building air tightness. A couple of different ASTMs and obviously the core protocol is, is a tool by which to, to test the whole building. Infrared thermography and smoke diagnostics and some, some other type diagnostic tools for, uh, for the, the, the qualitative part of, of commissioning the building enclosure. ASTM E1186 is a, a great tool that identifies a number of different ways that, uh, of diagnostic tools to, to identify leakage paths. Everyone always asks about cost and budget, and so, so I'll share this with you from, from NIBS guideline three. I'm not gonna read the top part other than to say, uh, who knows? I mean, this is, if you can follow the track here, it's the owner's project requirement kind of defines what the scope is going to be. And so it's hard to put a dollar figure on that scope if it's driven by the owner's project requirements. But here's some guidance. I mean, that's, this, is, this is a number that we you know, share with contractors and design builders on, from a budget perspective, and owners for also on a, on a budget perspective. These happen to be right out of NIBS guideline three. So 0.3% up to a percent of, of construction value. Okay, so let's get into some, some specific case studies. This is a, a dining facility in Fort Carson in Colorado. Lead Gold, not a huge building, but probably a pretty typical dining facility, 25, 26,000 square feet. And uh, you know, in the $14 million range for, for construction costs, there's, a, there's a, a fee for you, and we'll get, we'll get into the scope here. But this is an old lead version 2.2. This is, this is kind of two, well, it's really just one lead version ago. Uh, but there's buried in the credit interpretation rulings for lead in that version is how to get an innovation and design credit for commissioning the building enclosure. I'm not sure how many people pursued it, how many times that point was actually awarded. Uh, this actually just came through a couple of months ago. So uh, it's, 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 one, it's one point, one data point really, but I uh, want to talk through what the scope looked like because from LEED's perspective, from USGBC's perspective, this met their, their intent or their requirements for, which is otherwise not spelled out greatly in, in this credit interpretation ruling. So here's, here's the scope of what was done. Uh, some involvement in design, good old fashioned whiteboard work for, for the architects, just kind of working through different details. Uh, and then actually at the, the DD and CD phase, looking through documents, identifying some issues uh, a, a technical peer review. This is a this was a great this was a great mock-up uh, in my opinion. Here's a freestanding wall. This is the cladding that's going to be on the building. Uh, for for blast purposes, it's 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 punched window, but it's a curtain wall product. And so we decided to flash 
the left window one way and flash it a different way on the other side just to see how they would perform, see how the trades would meet when they did come together. Uh, and it was a very, it was a very informative process to know, you know which, which path did we actually want to go on to, to populate the entire building. And, and this was probably somewhat unique in that uh, I want sequencing drawings. So I want to know specific to my window type, specific to my cladding and my weather barrier type, this is how I want to install my window. Step one through step 15 in isometric. Uh, probably not a typical part of a commissioning program, but what a great way for, for a contractor to sit down with subcontractors and, and, and kind of walk through the process of, you're gonna start here, you're gonna start there, you own this scope, you own this scope. Uh, it's a great tool. And obviously something that, that the, the, the core inspector was tied into as well to, to make sure that there was buy-in there. What I want to highlight in, in, in the construction phase of things is that while we are inspecting what's there, a good commissioning provider in any trade, in, in any discipline really, should be able to tell you where you're about to go wrong. I think we've probably seen a lot of pictures over the last couple of days of things that, that went wrong. Well, let's, let's prevent it from going wrong. Here's this, on this dining facility, there was a steep slope roof area and a low slope roof area. And, and there was uh, you know, a, a head wall condition right there. That's a pretty funky piece of flashing because that's coping, that's standing seam metal roof, metal wall panel, Tyvek behind it. So there's a lot going on there and, and let's identify it. If, if it's a, if a kind of a strange detail you would have a hard time looking at in the CDs in 2D, well, let's work it out in the field before they even show up. And, and, and more simplistically, things like roofing inspections. Uh, we talked about insulation gaps in, in walls. Certainly there's, there's requirements in roofs. So, so you're looking at, you know, within one discipline, within one trade, absolutely. But the complexity is really where that discipline, that trade meets each other. Uh, bottom right photo is, is is a punched window opening with metal panel above and soon to be a single ply roof membrane below. So now we've got to play with single ply roofing as we're flashing a window. It's kind of a complex detail. Punched window ASTM E783 testing uh, and E1105, so air leakage and water penetration. Uh, so, we, so if you track the history, we did this in the mock-up freestanding. Then we picked one sample, not a big building, so we basically sampled one of every general window type throughout, throughout the building. And that looked like a punched opening here, a storefront area, and some daylighting devices on the roof. And here's the, the daylighting on the bottom left side, uh, some storefront, and a, a Calwell type fiberglass uh, panel window opening top left. Had some performance issues. But you know, we're, we're looking at these things in, at the 5% install level. So you know, a, commission, a, a testing agency, a commissioning provider may be the bearer of bad news, but at least we knew about it, at least the contractor knew about it well before we're finishing the inside, certainly well before we're turning the building over. Uh, it's, you, you happen to be bearing bad news, but it, but it certainly can get a lot worse down the line. And all the issues we're able to identify and correct you know, well before uh, you know, interior finishes were installed. Whole building testing, obviously a requirement for air tightness. And, and if Lee didn't impart uh, what, what we like to emphasize as far as the, uh, how this can be done, is being done, I think will continue to be, be done well at a very tight rate. So here's a, a relatively, I would call a relatively small building, maybe a, a medium sized building. Uh, and as Lee showed you the, the, the size curve, so as we get larger, uh, we certainly can get tighter and tighter. Well, here's in, in, more, in more of what I would call a difficult territory to, to you know, not meet the requirement, but, but really exceed the requirement. And here we are at you know, 0.11 CFM per square foot at 75 Pascal. So well less than half of the requirement. Pretty tight building. And obviously the, the transitions of things during construction is something that was part of the commissioning program, part of what we're looking at in the quality assurance piece. Here's a, here's a somewhat local project down the street. Anybody involved here that's, that's involved at Fort Hood at the Carl, at Darnell Hospital replacement? No? Okay. Um, million square foot medical center. 
targeted at lead silver we're we're wrapping up we're very well in design probably wrapping that up here within the next couple of months a little bit of below grade work uh, you know half a million dollar project there's a there's a fee for a full commissioning program uh, and this was actually there was in the RFP there was a commissioning spec in division seven that was a, an appendix to the RFP that said put this in your design package so for the spec writers here for or for, for folks that own the RFP uh, it's an option I mean you can it's design build but you can insert a spec if you want to maybe I'm talking out of my out of my league here but but we're, we've seen projects where if there's a specific requirement and we truly want to put the actual spec in we'll put the whole spec into an RFP just just pieces of them and otherwise the the design team is able to design and specify their project as they like number of different uh, design phase reviews uh, the, the the infamous pen test that you've heard about 11 times so far this week uh, was, was part of you know what was a, re a requirement really value engineering and value analysis all you building enclosure guys that get sort of cringe when you when you hear VE they actually asked the building enclosure guy to get involved in the VE so we could not VE flashing which is what lots of people like to do but actually VE some things that are that maybe got slipped by example is uh, and, and it's truly VE we had a we had a brick relief angle in a wall that didn't need one pull out your your brick industry association tech notes we you know we think you should have a, a relief angle at this at walls this height and above um, so that was part of the, the VE process and and we talked about Wolfie and some other modeling it's, it's also part of this scope as well something that's pretty slick uh, very savvy design builder by the way very savvy and so they're actually taking uh, Vela is a is a system that's out there a commercial system of, of one of many the design builder happens to be using this but it's at, at minimum it's construction documents in the field and so their inspectors literally have there's about a dozen iPods iPads running around with a sash and it's in a backpack and they're pulling up details as they're walking the site looking at inspections they actually take their the the, the issued for construction drawings and physically link between you know a detail that's referenced in wall section of sheet whatever to the actual detail sheet in the architecture and you, you, you touch the detail reference and it jumps you to that sheet pretty slick uh, the other thing that, that I, the design builder is chewing on it's certainly more money but it's BIM in the field and so uh, this is really maybe we'll talk about BIM in the field next year at this conference or maybe two years from now uh, but it's 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 software that's out there right now to literally bring the BIM model into the field with you on one of these and actually do construction inspection work tie tie a picture to it tie a checklist to it uh, so it's pretty, it's pretty we're not we're not quite here yet in construction as far as this project but that's part of what's going to be part of the test and, and then obviously uh, it's a requirement so whole building testing probably hard to see in the back but there's a red line and a blue line and so you know red line to the left blue to the right it's a million square foot building and we're cutting it in half to test it because I don't know that you could test that you need a heck of a lot of equipment to test that in one in one fell swoop uh, but identifying that in design and so uh, the mechanical system happened to be separated sort of naturally between what you see on the right and the three pods that you see on the left very minor bit of work in design and really in construction to, to treat those as sort of two separate zones uh, and it's really it's mechanical system related and it's also facilitating the test as well and some some scope items yet to be accomplished in, in construction a lot of the things we just talked about with uh, checklists uh, submittals quality assurance observations uh, we, we talked a little bit about training earlier in the day today and so why not have the commissioning provider that's going to be doing QA work periodic work and why don't they teach the QC personnel for the contractor about what they're going to look for and then we're all looking for the same thing and then your QA program is truly part of your QC program within the design build world uh, and you're all looking at the same thing and you're all kind of talking about the same thing so something that's that's getting done on this project last example that I, that I want to bring up is uh, a retro commissioning project and so a little bit of context here 
it is, I mean, we all know about sort of budget issues with, in, in the educational world, kind of across the board. Here's, Poudre School District is the school district for the Fort Collins area, Northern Colorado, uh, Colorado State University. It's kind of a university town. Think of it kind of like Austin, uh, maybe a little bit smaller than Austin, but sort of similar, uh, similar type geography. And the school district went, is going through an entire retro commissioning program for the entire school district. And so they, they've identified that part of what that program looks like is, is pairing a building enclosure commissioning agent with a controls mechanical systems commissioning agent and, and truly treating the building like a system. So in the retro commissioning world, there's obviously some inspection work and some, some analysis of the existing building and that's done on the mechanical system and the control system and the building enclosure. And we identify, you know, where energy conservation matters, where's the best bang for the buck. Maybe it's not in the building enclosure world. Maybe it's, maybe it's truly we're not at anywhere near efficient pumps and fans. Uh, but it certainly, it, you know, it was, it was a data point for part of the decision making process. Pretty large building. Here's, uh, you know, we did some whole building testing and, and some diagnostics on a series of about 10 schools. A couple of high schools, a couple, uh, couple of middle schools, and then a good number of, of elementary schools. And I don't expect you to see the results here. Uh, I plotted them a little bit later. It tell, tells a story. While the leakage rates weren't significantly, really even significantly above what the core requires in new construction projects, uh, the, I, I'm sure we talked about equivalent leakage area, the, the whole size for when we're testing a whole building. And single store, si single door or double door garage doors open, the equivalent of that in the building throughout the operation of these buildings. So significant areas for improvement on, on a number of these, these buildings. Lots of different, lots of different things going wrong here. I won't, I won't spend a whole lot of time. Uh, it was not a cloudy day. That's, that's thermal fog coming from that we've introduced to the inside of the building, pressurizing the building to the outside. So Things like low slurp roof to wall interfaces are, are a culprit. Maybe even before that, having something that could even remotely qualify as, a, as an air barrier on a building that's more than 10 years old is, is a probability that it does not have something like that. Probably building paper, maybe just CMU and that's as a backup wall and, and that's it. Uh, so obviously the existing building world introduces a lot more, a lot more issues. Uh, steep slope roof to wall, lots of leakage locations there. Expansion joints you can see in, in infrared in a couple different places. Some, some air leakage points and some thermal discontinuities. Beam pockets, this is probably a pretty typical construction for lots and lots and lots of gymnasiums out there. CMU backup wall, pretty high wall. Joist, be, be, uh, excuse me, bar joists or, or angle joists and just hanging in a beam pocket. And so every X feet, there's a, there's a big old hole. You can see it in the bottom left, a big old thermal discontinuity and big old air leakage pocket as well. Simple things like, like adjusting doors properly. Uh, you, you, you wouldn't think it, but it doesn't take a whole lot of, I mean, there are maintenance personnel that, that work on these buildings. Um, it costs the district nothing to have some sort of simple program to to literally check to see that, that strikes are, you know, the doors are closing on strikes properly. Not, these are not, this is not a, you know, an ERV. This is not a enthalpy wheel. This is pretty simple stuff that can, that can add up. Soffits and mansard roofs. Soffits leak, by the way. Old soffits absolutely leak. Uh, roof transitions are, are obviously a leakage, a leakage point as well. Clear stories, both, both new and old. Here's the funny part about air, if, if, if someone has not mentioned it, is, you know, water does a pretty good job of going down. Uh, air can, can go up too. And so flashing, as we've been flashing for many moons, works great for, for water, uh, may not for air, and no bigger culprit than skylights. Skylights, they, they don't all leak, but, you know, one would not think to seal the underside of, of flashing because water's not gonna get in there. Uh, air, air certainly does. Simple things in a retrofit world that that you can do. Uh, and here's the plot that I mentioned. So again, while the leakage rates were not, you know, sort of through the roof on the top of the chart there, but, but plotted with their peers size-wise, new construction peers size-wise. So all of the red dots that you see there are, are 
just about consistently higher than any of the new construction air tightness, air tightness requirements. And, and obviously thermal discontinuities that ASTM uh, C1060 is, is something that great application for, for existing buildings. And so I, I guess what I wanna, what I wanna bef before I pass it off is what I wanna take away from this is, uh, this was kind of part one for uh, a retro commissioning effort. The, the effort is ongoing to look at all the data from uh, mechanical control systems commissioning provider from enclosure commissioning, retro commissioning provider and figure out the, the energy conservation measures that make sense. And maybe fixing some of this stuff, while I'd like to see all of it fixed, uh, maybe that's not the starting point. But it becomes a, it becomes a tool to make decisions, which is, which is crucial. And I think we'll save the, we'll the Q&A piece for towards the end of the presentation. So thank you. <laughs>